You are listening to From Sobriety to Recovery with Jesse Mogul. Welcome to the show. Hello, 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 my friends. My name is Jesse Mogul, and I am in addiction recovery, and you are listening to From Sobriety to Recovery. It is so excellent and awesome to have you here today. And once again, as always, I am honored to have your ears, whatever app you're listening to me on. Thank you so much. I'm blessed to have you here. Today's episode is, once again, it's gotten me super excited. Um, I just left one of my men's group meetings. Uh, this doesn't have anything to do with addiction. This is more of uh, like a business, marketing, advertising. Uh, it's it's a it's this men's group full of uh, media and entertainment technology uh, alpha leaders. It stands for Metal, and it's a fantastic group of just go get 'em guys who are all looking to level themselves up and just become the best version of themselves. And so I'm an, I'm honored to be a, a part of this group and. In order for, and it's a huge group, I mean, there's like 500,000, I don't know, when we have our weekly meetings in this theater, there's hundreds of us, and in order for us to have better connections with one another, the head of the, the leader, the founder of Metal, um, instituted this pod, um, pod group policy, that policy sounds like rules, it's not, but basically we all get to break down into our own little groups of men where we could discuss certain things that were important to us. And so I chose the pod group led by my buddy Glenn, who actually introduced me to metal. And it was all about longe- longevity and understanding, you know, the human mind and the human body and the spirit and the entire essence of humanity of, of who we are in order to become this great, amazing version of ourselves. And it's everything I wanted it to become. It is, it is growing all the time. When I first uh, heard about what he was doing, I really thought that this would have a lot to do with the kind of things I talk about, whether it be, you know, growth mindset and flexibility and tenacity and discipline and all. And it really is. It has literally become that. Today, when I show up, I walk in on a conversation about growth mindset. And then there's another couple guys talking about discipline. And I'm like, they're literally using my favorite buzzwords. So it's an absolutely amazing meeting this morning. And we were talking about neuroplasticity. That was the entire... uh, theme of today's two-hour meeting. And I mean, as I'm sitting there, I'm like, I cannot wait to get on the headset with you guys and start talking about this because in the idea of going from someone who was uh, addicted and using and putting these chemicals into their system in order to change who they were and their mindset and their body, everything, everything about us changes when we start to become intoxicated and it becomes a lifelong, you know, really just pattern that we've established for ourselves. Now we're moving into sobriety and recovery, and we're asking our minds, our brains, to build an entire new neural network that operates on the the belief that we can live a life without being intoxicated. And i Decided not to do a plethora of research before this one. I really just wanted, I mean, I've been home for maybe a half an hour. I've written up some show notes. I'm taking some things from the from the meeting that I put into my notes on my phone. And I'm just, I really want to just get into this because I want you all to get an opportunity to just hear what it sounds like for me whenever I'm really just starting to build new ideas and new neural pathways. And I'm not going to get into a bunch of sciencey stuff. That's not my forte. It is certainly not my forte. Um, I, you know, I love I love me some science to a certain degree. Um, even as I was googling around for this, I ended up finding a, a website called Neuroscience for Kids <laughs> because I'm like, this is how I want to talk about it. Um, you know, I can start talking about myelin sheaths and and neurotransmitters and dendrites and all and synapses and all this stuff. And it sounds great. And, you know, certainly there's an ability to go find more information about this, but I'm not, I don't want to get lost in the, in the smarty pants talk and miss really the, um, the layman's terms that we could be using to just start being able to implement this into your own life. And the first thing that I thought of whenever I was sitting in that meeting, thinking about how can I bring this to you guys was just The sheer understanding that your brain can adapt to anything at all, if it's just given enough practice and time to 
to learn it and develop it and implement it. And it can be done. Your brain can literally learn all new manners of behavior and beliefs and attitudes, everything. Everything can be changed if you just give it enough time and practice, effort, focus, prioritization, all of those. And this is how I know it. I knew it before this meeting, but um, Julian, the guy, he runs his business and he did his uh, business partners and him do a lot of neuroplasticity research. And uh, they have some really interesting um, games that they have the the subjects play in order to learn more about how their bl- how their brain can adapt and learn new behaviors and skills relatively quickly. And so he brought two of those to the meeting today. And the two he brought, oh my goodness, I mean, you know, uh, me being me, I had to definitely be the first one to volunteer for the one. Uh, because last week, when or two weeks ago when he had mentioned it, I was thoroughly, thoroughly um, entertained by just the notion of playing this game. So here's what the game was. He brings a target and he, he attaches it to a chair and then we stand about six to eight feet away. We have we have bean bags and we throw the bean bags at the target. And I have a long, extensive career uh, playing a game called Cornhole with a red Solo cup in my hand. And so I feel like I have got a lot of muscle memory around the practice of throwing a bean bag at a target. And so needless to say, the moment he gives me the bean bags and I start throwing them at, at the target, um, just no, not a problem. Every single one hits the target and, and, and time after time after time, I'm hitting bullseyes. And so, okay, so step one, we know that Jesse has the muscle memory to throw a beanbag at a target. So then he grabs out like what would look, what basically looks like construction workman goggles. And they have been specially treated with sort of like a kaleidoscope thing on the, on the cover of them. He says they were specifically built for um, high school students to learn what it's like to be intoxicated so that they learn not to get behind the wheel of a car, um, how their visual impairment would look like if they were intoxicated without actually getting, you know, high school kids drunk. <laughs> and so there, if you've ever seen these drunk goggles is what I'll call them, not the ones that you are more than familiar with, drunk goggles, you know, what you have at a bar at two in the morning and what leads to bad decisions and regret in the morning. But these are literally goggles that you put on and it messes with your vision. And what it does or what it did for me and for the rest of my buddies in this in this group this morning was it shifted everything over to the left by about two to three feet. So I put the goggles on, and then I go to throw the beanbag at the target. And I think I've got some pictures of this they took. I'll post them on uh, my Instagram, uh, the sobriety page, and probably the Jesse Mogul page too, and at some point, even the college page. But so, again, first time, no goggles, hitting the target every single time. This is how I know the brain can learn things really quickly and adapt because we put the goggles on me and then I go to throw the bean bags and immediately the bean bags, I'm, I'm looking at the target. I'm looking at where I think the target is, but the bean bags start going to the left by two or three feet. And so the first round, and there's eight bean bags per round, the first round, um, you know, I start getting closer and closer because I start to aim more to the right. By the second round, I'm actually hitting the target uh, maybe two or three times. By the third round, half the time I'm hitting the target. And then by the fourth round, as long as I stop and I concentrate, but I don't aim at the target in front of me, I start to aim uh, you know, off to the right, like I had been doing, it was more consistent. And so now here we are, the brain, where it was aiming straight ahead and hitting the target every time, now the brain is aiming off to the right in order to hit a target that is directly in front of it and not throw it to the left. All right, you following me so far? I'm telling you, this was so exciting to be a part of. Um, You probably find these goggles on Amazon and and practice this at home. It was just so entertaining. So then we take the goggles off and the target's clear eyes. Target's directly in front of me. Now I'm looking right at the target. I go to throw it and my hand is throwing it two to three feet to the right. And because now my vision's back to being normal and even though I'm looking right at the target, the beanbag is not, going anywhere near the target. And again, we do another four rounds. And by the end of the fourth round, I'm starting to hit it with more consistency. Um, By the fifth round, no problem. You know, my vision's gotten back. I'm not hitting it every single time like I did the very first experiment with when I had not put the goggles on at all. But now all of a sudden, my vision is starting to correct itself. 
I mean, this is neuroplasticity at its basic core, that your vision can be altered and you can learn how to operate in that new world. And where this really started to spark my imagination uh, was like, I used to consider myself the best drunk driver that there ever was because I had put myself into so many positions where I had no choice but to drive home. And in many cases, no matter how bad my vision was, no matter how many lines I saw, I, I would know how to focus on the correct one. Uh, I had a system where I would lock my knee um, up up underneath the, the steering wheel so that uh, I wouldn't be swerving all over the road. I, you know, we all have something like that where we thought, man, I was just so good at being wasted. No one was ever better than me at being wasted. Well, what ultimately this experiment proved to me today was that I had just grown accustomed to my vision being off like that. Um, you know, certainly I remember getting my DUI in college right around the same time that me and a lot of friends ended up getting DUIs within that same year. And one of the cops said to one of my buddies, uh, cause his blood alcohol was well above three. She's like, you're a pro at this, aren't you? And you know, his response was just like, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a pro. Cause if you have a BA blood alcohol, BAC above a three, it, you, you clearly have a high tolerance. And even when I got my DUI, when the, when they finally um, blood tested me, I think it was a point one eight, um, and I'd already been in the hospital for two or three hours, so it was it was definitely well above a three at the beginning because I started making them put IV bags in me. Uh, the moment I showed up, knowing full well that the cops were going to come and, and want to test me. So, anyways, okay, sidebar over. Back to the neuroplasticity. So, when you hear me tell this example of how you're you can throw the beanbag straight, put on the goggles, eventually, you know, within minutes, your brain can start to reorganize itself and start aiming off to the right in order to hit a target that's directly in front of it. Then you can take the goggles off, and now all of a sudden you are throwing it off to the right, and within a few minutes your brain can readjust, recalibrate, and boom, now you're throwing it at the target dead in front of you again. Now, how does this help us in our sobriety and recovery mission? You know, think about how you have become habituated to certain beliefs, certain behaviors, patterns in your life. I, I know that one of my limiting beliefs that I had when I first got sober was I was never going to be able to have fun again. I wasn't going to be fun to be around. I wasn't going to be able to go to barbecues and picnics where people were drinking and enjoy myself because I'd always done it intoxicated. I mean, obviously not until I'd gotten to my senior year in high school did I ever touch alcohol. But back then, you know, when those events happened, and for me, my family rarely ever attended things like that nature, barbecues and picnics and social functions. We lived far away from our family, and my parents didn't have any friends. Um, so I didn't really have a lot of those experiences. So when I get to college, and all of a sudden you go over to your, your friends' houses on the weekend, and you're grilling up some burgers and some hot dogs, of course there's a keg in the bathtub. Right, And so the moment I started learning how to socialize in these kind of environments where lots of people gathered, alcohol was involved. Alcohol was always involved. And if you can look back at your high school, or and specifically, especially your college years, if you were into that, and if you weren't when you graduated high school and you started going over to your friends' houses and you started you know, hanging out with people that you worked with, alcohol was there. If alcohol wasn't there, then you're probably not listening to this show, right? If drugs weren't around you, then you're probably not listening to this show. So at a very young age, we start getting habituated to this idea that with that when you meet up with lots of people, alcohol's involved, okay? And so where does neuroplasticity play in this? Again, smarty pants words, there's, there's neurons and there's synapses. Neurons are basically like these hubs of cells. And again, if, I, if I'm not, explaining this correctly i'm not gonna I'm, I'm pacing back and forth in my studio because i just i don't i really want to get my energy out on this one i'm not going to sit here and use a bunch of science terms if you go off and google this and, I, and i've explained it incorrectly that's great go ahead and let me know that but what i will what what but i'll be very succinct in how i'm going to explain it i these neurons are like these hubs of cells and they fire information back and forth to one another uh, through these synapses. And I believe dendrites is a word, and it has something to do with 
the way that these are built up. Um, it's almost like I'm trying not to use smarty words. Here's what, here's what the neuroscience for kids says. Neurons have spe specialized projections called dendrites and axons. Dendrites bring information to the cell body and axons take information away from the cell body. For information from one neuron flows to another neuron across the synapses. Okay, so the synapses is the road and the neurons are the houses. So in order for, for one piece of one person to go from one house to another house, they have to travel along the road, which is the synapse. Okay, so you've got a house, which is a neuron. You've got a synapse, which is a road. Dendrites are what take you to your buddy's house and an axon would be what would take you back to your house from your buddy's house, right? If if that's, just picture this with me. <laughs> I really hope that you're following along. Um, it, you know, neuroscience for kids still seems really complicated. <laughs> uh, maybe one day I'll bring in my roommate. He, he, he studied uh, neuroscience in college and he's into that, the smarty pants kind of stuff. Uh, I'm the journalist who goes and meets people like him and then just tells their story. So, it, so okay, so let's get back to um, neuroplasticity and our addiction here. So you have built up these th these repeated behaviors of going to barbecues and having to get intoxicated, right? So when you show up there, the the neurons they they remember where you're at, they understand what's going on, and so they start firing to back and forth to one another. Oh, okay, well we're getting ready to get alcohol, we're getting ready to get intoxicated. And the more you went to these things, the more you do any behavior. If you've never thrown a baseball and then all of a sudden I hand you one, your neurons, they know how to throw. You've thrown. And if you haven't, we can, you know, you've seen a three-year-old or a five-year-old learn to throw. They're not great at it. Well, as they start to practice, these neurons are firing back and forth along one another. And the synapse that they're firing back and forth on, it begins to get thicker and thicker the more they repeat the behavior. Right, I've got in my show notes that a super highway versus a single string. When a five-year-old throws a baseball for the first time, that string is just now being formed. They are just now learning how to throw a baseball. When you started going to barbecues and somebody started handing you alcohol, you didn't know that that was a thing, but then all of a sudden that string got built from one neuron to the next saying, hey, go to barbecue, get alcohol. If you started going to barbecues for 90 days straight, you would definitely have a thick super highway that told you every time you went to a barbecue, you were going to get alcohol. Just like with a kid, throws that baseball long enough in that yard that first day, all of a sudden that single little thin thread becomes almost like a shoelace. But now the kid just keeps throwing and throwing and throwing and throwing. And before you know it, that shoelace has turned into literally a super highway where throwing that ball is just, it's, it's muscle memory at this point. Okay, and so this is where we're at in our journey, guys, is that we are literally taking these super highways that we have created and we're smashing them to bits and we're t and from the rubble, we are building brand new super highways. All right? So where you where when you go to do something for the first time in sobriety, when you go to do something, even if it's the 100th time in sobriety, all it takes is a couple different variables to be different at that barbecue or at that meeting or in that situation for your brain to want to go back to the super highway it's already familiar with. This like somebody posted up on um, Instagram yesterday that uh, I, 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 it was one of my posts and it was about, um, you know what, I'm going to pause real fast and I'm going to pull it up. Okay, awesome. So I found it. Thank you for your patience. I guess that for you was no patience at all. <laughs> I just went from one thing to the next. If you go over to my From Sobriety to Recovery Instagram account, it's the one that I posted on, um, it would have been yesterday and today is the... Uh, I don't even know what today is. It was, it's the one that's all about a beautiful... So it would have been the one from Friday, August 23rd. And it's about a beautiful day begins with a beautiful mindset. When you wake up, take a second to think about what a privilege is simply to be alive and healthy. The moment you start acting like life is a ble blessing, I assure you it will start to feel like one. And someone in there uh, had posted about not feeling like his... Uh, like he wishes... Some days I wish I didn't wake up so my family don't have to deal with a dad or partner that is a complete failure. Um, 
And then I came back and responded, you know, his profile clearly states with hard work, you can achieve anything. And so I, it's, so my thought was, you know, you aren't a failure. You're just getting feedback on how to do it better the next time. And then he responded with just at the moment, it doesn't feel like, it feels like it doesn't matter what I do. Nothing changes. And then I came back with uh, the day you plant the seed isn't the day you eat the fruit. And then uh, someone else came back with a really great, um, statement right off the bat, you know, believe me, your family would rather that you are there than not there at all. Okay. So we've gone over that. And the the reason I bring this is like, this is where the neuroplasticity plays in guys. We have, this gentleman has this super highway built up about their behaviors, their patterns, what they can achieve, what they can't, you know, and and he's looking to destroy the super highway that says, you know, I need to be intoxicated to do this, or I, Whatever this limiting belief that he has, and we've got, I mean, all humans have them. Tony Robbins and and, and presidents of, of countries have these limiting beliefs. It's not a surprise that we have them. Right now, we're just looking at them through this, through this spectrum, through these goggles of addiction. And just like the goggles I wore today, they're blurred. They're askewed. We're aiming right to hit something that's straight in front of us. But instead, everything's landing to the left. Just be patient with the fact that you have these super highways built around these behaviors, these attitudes, these beliefs about yourself. Yesterday when I got snippy with my roommate because the garbage stunk when I came home from work and it hadn't been taken out, rather than take a breath, figure out, you know, just go take, just rather than saying something snippy and then taking it out, I could have just as easily said, hey, you know, you want me to take that out or, or you got that, right? Like I could have stopped and taken a breath. but. Because of addiction, and my therapist reminds me this a lot, there's a lack of in- impulse control in us. There's a lack of impulse control. Somebody's like, ah, you know, let's do some drugs and party all night. Sure, let's go do it right now. You know, that's why you people who drink a lot of alcohol want to get into fights and arguments. There's no impulse control. So I have this humongous super highway of no impulse control that has been around for who knows how long. Right, probably it was probably building when I was a child, but then whenever you get into teenage and especially from eighteen to twenty-five, when they say a huge, I think my therapist tells me constantly that a huge amount of impulse control, growth and development occurs from that eighteen to twenty-five to twenty-seven range. Right. Well, that's when I was at the peak of my addiction. That's when I was taking six different kinds of drugs and, and drinking every all every night. Hell, by the time I got in my thirties, all the drugs went away. It was just the alcohol. That's beyond the point. It, I have impulse control superhighway issues. I'm trying to decimate an, a superhighway where I did not have impulse control, and I'm trying to build a new superhighway where I have impulse control. Whatever this gentleman was referencing in his Instagram post about thinking that his, his, his family thought he was a failure, I can assure you, like the woman responded, they are much happier that you're there than not. You're going to learn, dude. If you're listening to this show, you're going to learn whatever these failures are. That's, first of all, perceived failures, okay? Because there is no failure. There's only feedback, right? Just like any success is only a perceived success. Your success to somebody else could be a failure to them. When I used to do CrossFit, somebody had a shirt that I absolutely loved. It was like, it it just said, I'm paraphrasing now because I, I think I'm getting ready to add something. But well, the part I think I'm getting ready to add is relax, just do your best. The part I know the shirt said was right now out there somewhere, someone is warming up with your max. All right. So your perceived failure and your perceived successes right now out there, somebody wishes they could have your failure today because that would be their success. Somebody out there right now would look at your success and think that to themselves was a failure on their part. So even beginning to rank yourself next to somebody else is a self-defeating prophecy. It doesn't work that way. Your neuroplasticity around certain areas in your life is not going to be the same as mine. Even if you were raised with a twin and you thought you were experiencing the exact same life, I can assure you, you were not. There's a story that that I I learned in my life coaching world uh, where it talks about how two twins were raised by an alcoholic and a a criminal father. 
one of the the twins goes off and goes to law school and helps people who are victimized by criminals. The other one follows in his dad's footsteps and becomes an alcoholic and a criminal. And when asked at 40 years old during this study, it was a real study, um, they were asked, you know, why did you turn out the way that you turned out? And they both answered with the same, I'm sure for the story, I'm I'm sure we're going to say it's the same, but I'm sure in reality it was just similar. But they both responded with, with a dad like that, how can I turn out any different? You can think you're living the exact same life as one of your siblings or as your partner or as one of your best friends or as a coworker, but you are not. And so thinking that you have the same neural path superhighways is inconceivably wrong. (laughs) Is that the right way? It's just inconceivable. Okay. And so we're, I mean, there's an, God, I mean, just, I'm so loving learning about this stuff because I realize where I can be getting better. I know that in these, I talked to my dad who's got 25 years as an alcohol and drug abuse counselor about my behavior, you know, and just the way that I snapped at my roommate, you know, and if he's just like, look, you just got to take a breath. You've got to ask yourself, you know, is this really important? Will this be important in three hours, three days, three months? And if the fact that the garbage was in there, it, that will not matter. It won't be that important in three days. It wouldn't have even been that important in three hours. To me, what it was, it was, it was a big overarching issue. As in like, you know, are you even respecting the house? Do you even respect your roommates enough to take out the garbage? And again, he could have just woken up. He could have walked downstairs, been making his morning cup of coffee, and he, had, and he did just smelled it. You know, because he said that he had smelled it from his bedroom door when he woke up, I immediately assumed that means he normally gets up at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., and here it is, it's noon, 1230. So I, okay, six hours, you let this garbage stew in the kitchen. But that that's a story I told myself. I don't know that that's true. So stop, take a breath, have some impulse control. Realize you're operating with these super highways you don't want to be driving down anymore. Nothing that you're learning, nothing that you're turning into is a failure. It's feedback. You're going to go down these super highways over and over and over and over again because you have been going down them for years, decades. Since you were a kid, you didn't even know that you were building these super highways in your head. And now you're stuck driving down them, but you don't want to be anymore. It's when you bring that into your awareness and you say, okay, well, what, am, what, did I, what have I done just now to get me into this situation? I know that by, I know about myself that generally whenever something doesn't go as I wanted it to, or like, you know, I was having a great day until I walked into the house and it smelled the garbage. And then all of a sudden I snap because I immediately am like, you know, I would have taken that out. Why didn't he take it out? Right. Rather than just stopping, taking a breath and realizing there's, there's something to be learned here. There's, there's an impulse control. This happened the other day with my book publisher. I felt like she was squeezing me in. And, you know, in my little world, I felt like she wasn't, you know, she wasn't honoring the hard work I'd done. She was giving me the attention that I wanted. And so I popped off. I didn't really pop off, but I got a little snippy. And I apologize for it multiple times. And I say this because, and let's go back. This is what I know about myself. 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, three or four max. But let's, okay, handful of minutes later, I... What my brain will have calmed down, it will figure out a solution to the issue, and it will not matter as much as it does right now in this second. This is this has happened to me at work. You know, back you know, the manager might come in and say, you know what, we're gonna move the coffee pot. We don't want the coffee pot there anymore, we want it here. Well, I've built up all these habits about knowing where that coffee pot is, its proximity to the cups and the sugar and everything else. I don't want the coffee pot moved. So back in the day, I'd get upset and immediately want to argue about where the coffee pot was going to be. Then I learned to just stop. Let the coffee pot go wherever they wanted to go. They got their reasons. It could be trivial to me or it could be super important to them. It doesn't matter. They're the ones who want to move the coffee pot. They're the ones who are supposedly in charge. Actually, they really are. I just may not always think that they should be. The point is, let them move the coffee pot, damn it. If in a few days, what they've done seems completely asinine, like, why did you move the coffee pot from the kitchen at the workplace to the bathroom? That's stupid. Then we can re, we can re, uh, re-meet, readjust to what they've done. We can reevaluate whether it was a good idea or not, and then we can move forward from there. But getting upset about uh, this change that I did not see coming isn't beneficial to me. 
Because in many cases, a day or two or three later, my brain is just like it did today with the bean bags. It's readjusted. What what used to be in front of me now I need to aim to the right. Where the coffee pot used to be now I've built now I've just changed all the habits around where it's located and I'm fine with that. Ask yourself if it do you see this in yourself? Is this something that you can notice within your own um, behaviors? It's it's just it, I marvel at the idea that all of this stuff that we're working on it's changing us guys. It's working. It's working with the proper practice, with time invested, and with trial and error, we're going to get better. But this is what gets you better because you get to practice, right? You, and you, you properly practice. I'm going to go over the half hour a little bit here because I, I think I've gotten super excited about this and I'm really hoping that you're all following along because I, I think this is going to be extremely valuable. I, I know it is. It's one of the things that we talked about is, are you practicing properly to build the correct neuro superhighway? Right? If you're learning to throw a, a football incorrectly, and I, and I referenced in the meeting Tim Tebow, he, threw the, he, he likes to throw the ball sidearmed. Well, in college that worked um, because your accuracy doesn't need to be as spot on in college because the best players just tend to be way better than, the media, than even just the good players. But in the pros, everyone's amazing. So you can't be off by a millimeter or you're gonna, you're, you will not succeed. And that was his issue. He was used to throwing the ball sidearmed. He could not learn how to throw it correctly. Therefore, his accuracy didn't get any better. And he ultimately got run out out of the league. This is because back in the day, whenever he was throwing the ball, no one got him to throw it, quote unquote, correctly, right? So that he'd be prepared for the pros. He had a sidearm. He threw tons of touchdowns in high school, threw tons of touchdowns in college. So no one was going to correct it. It ultimately hindered his performance in the pros. And now he's no longer plays pros. I, I tell you this story because think about, are you practicing properly? When I pop off on my roommate, right, now the next time, uh, you know, I'm going to repeat to myself, stop, breathe, ask some questions, or just say, okay, well, you know, I want me, do you want me to take the garbage out? And he, he goes responsive and been like, no, I'll do it after I'm done making breakfast. I've got to throw something else equally stinky in there. I don't know. But the key is going to be to stop and just think about it. Practice properly. If every time you get in an argument with someone who lives in the same house with you, you immediately go straight to yelling and screaming, and then you calm down, and then you hash out the problem, and then everything's okay, that yelling and screaming part at the beginning is not acceptable. That is not having impulse control. That is not how emotionally mature people handle arguments. The homeostasis that you've created, that we've all created, and my therapist gave me a really cool drawing about this, a picture, picture with the homeostasis you've created around your addiction. For everybody who you had direct contact with on a regular basis, they all got used to how you reacted and responded to situations when you were intoxicated. So picture you're all on a boat and everyone's everyone's sitting down because they and they we everybody knows how to how to maneuver around you while you're intoxicated and everything's fine there's a balance even if they're not happy with it even if they hated the fact that you were intoxicated and it started fights at least they knew how they were going to react they knew they knew what to expect from you because you started to th- throw out patterns and consistencies that they could easily follow and i'm not saying that you just still didn't get yelled at by your loved ones for being drunk and showing up to things intoxicated. I'm just saying they knew exactly how to react and respond around you, right? They knew, exa- they, they knew what they were going to do because they've seen what you were going to do multiple times, tons of times. What my therapist talks about is how as soon as you decided to get sober, that all of a sudden on this boat where everyone was sitting down, you stood up and now the balance is completely thrown off. Even though the family wants you to be sober, wants you to get into recovery, they also have to learn what sobriety and recovery looks like through their eyes about you. They are also going through their own sobriety and recovery because they have been habituated, almost addicted to your behaviors, your actions, 
who you were as an addict. And now you all of a sudden you're bringing this new person around. And you're like, look, I'm new. I'm different. I'm better. Everybody love me. And they're, they're definitely excited for you. And they're definitely happy. And even if, you've, even if you haven't succeeded and you've relapsed multiple times, they're rooting for you. And if they're not rooting for you, stop being around them. But that's a different, that's a different episode I probably already covered. The homeostasis means that everybody else has built up these super highways of how to be around you. And now you're sober. And now you're coming around and everybody has these super highways of how to deal with you as an intoxicated individual. And they have this tiny little single string about how to deal with you as a sober person. Just like you have a tiny silver, a tiny little sliver of a string for how to be sober at home, at work, at barbecues, at baseball games, at wherever it is, right? And just like the little kid throwing the baseball, that little tiny string eventually grow, eventually will grow and it'll become a thread. And then it becomes a shoestring. And then over years, it actually becomes its own superhighway. But yes, it, if you have been addicted for years and years and years, it will take not necessarily an equal amount of time to recondition your brain and to rebuild a new superhighway, but it's going to take longer than just a day. Right? Like I put it in the Instagram post, the day you plant the seed is not the day you eat the fruit. You are not a failure because something that you wanted to go one way today didn't. Sit down, talk with your family, figure out what it is they would like to have seen you do differently. Explain to them the process that you went through in your mind that, that started the emotions, that drove the action, that created the result that you're thinking was a failure in their eyes. Because if you were supposed to show up on time to lunch and you were 20 minutes late, but at least you showed up sober, that is a great success compared to a year ago when you were showing up blacked out, wasted, and you made an ass of yourself in front of everybody. Right now, there is somebody praying to everything holy and sacred to have your failure today because it would be their greatest success. Just think about that, guys. There's this part in your brain down the base, it's called the hippocampus, and you've probably heard that word just because it sounds funny. It's a, it's like a mix between a hippo and a campus. I don't, but it's called the hippocampus, and it grows when you start to practice new behaviors because it's building these new memories. It's building these practices, these perceived failures, these, pe- these perceived successes. It's taking all of these in, and it's, and it's growing because it's learning all of this new stuff right? You're just going to have to learn this new stuff. Have the neuroplasticity to tell yourself, I'm going to figure this out. That's all a growth mindset is. It's just knowing that your brain will figure this out. And the thing we did today by putting on the goggles and throwing beanbags, I mean, it was the easiest way for me to be able to see from my own eyes that it only takes a few minutes for your eyes to adjust and then a few minutes to adjust back the other way. Some things will take minutes. Some things will take decades. Either way, it's okay. Each day is a new step forward. Have the growth mindset to know that if you're ready to figure something else out, that you will. Google more information. You know, I, I, I could easily Google information on how to, how to calm myself down when I get angry at someone else. Like there, there are blogs. There are studies. The internet is at your disposal. Do not overread. Find one or two that gives you some actionable steps right then. And then go out there and put them into action. Because action is how you get feedback whether it's a perceived failure or a perceived success. Either way, it is feedback. And that feedback is what builds expertise. And expertise is what creates a new superhighway. Every single one of us can do this. Every single one of us has this in us. I am not special. The people who came up with the, the studies are not special. Carol Dweck's mindset book is not special. The person who came out with some research that says, the, who tried to contradict it is not special. Everybody has their own perception of the world. You choose yours. 87 books could come out and say, growth mindset isn't as important as we think. I don't care. I believe that it is. I believe, me believing that I can change any aspect of myself if I just put focus and prioritization to it means that it will be, it will be done. 
even if I don't get to the outcome that I thought of right this second, I'm going to go to the gym and I hope that I look like Michael Phelps when he won seven gold medals. Even if I don't end up looking like Michael Phelps when he won seven gold medals, my body is going to look a hell of a lot better than it does right now in this moment when I just said it. A year from now, if I am working out like a person who wants to have Michael Phelps' body from those uh, from those Beijing Olympics, I assure you a year from now, my body is going to look way better than it does today when I just now said it. Even if you don't get to that vision that you had thought of when you started, you are going to get way, way further away from where you are now and way closer to that point. And it's all about practicing. It's all about action. It's all about whatever you need to do to write it down, to journal it, to make a podcast, post it on Instagram. You do whatever you need to do. Just do something. Because that single stream will become a super highway if you continue to push yourself in that direction. If you continue to go down the same super highway that it's always been there, then it will only get stronger. It will, it will start to get reinforced with rebar and more concrete and more concrete. And then one day you're going to turn around, you're going to be driving down that same damn road. And you said, why the hell am I still on this road? That's the difference between sobriety and recovery. Sobriety is white knuckling it, counting the days, not doing anything to move yourself to a new superhighway. Recovery, and this is, again, my opinion, this is my belief system, recovery is the act of realizing you're on the wrong superhighway, you want to be on this one, and you start to build the new superhighway. You start to question your actions, you start to question your beliefs and your attitudes and your, your morals and your ethics, and you make sure that they are, they are founded in gratitude and integrity and humility, because if you can have that perfect trifecta right there, I can assure you, things will get better. All right. I went really long on this one. Uh, I got a little soapboxy there. Uh, you know, I just, maybe this is more of a rah-rah motivational one, but I'm telling you, when I see this stuff, it's like, th this is why I got on so raw and didn't over-research this. Because this is the kind of enthusiasm that I get in my brain. I'm getting chills right now even talking about this because this is, this is it. I mean, these are the building blocks of a whole new life for yourself. Everything you want, everything you want to achieve, the person you've always wanted to become is literally on the other side of that door. All you have to do is reach for the doorknob. It's just going to take some time. Be patient. Ask for patience from yourself. Ask for patience from your loved ones. Communicate as thoroughly as possible and just have faith in the system. Have faith in the system, guys. I love you so much. Thank you once again for honoring me with your time, especially since I went so over what I normally do. Um, again, please hop on social media. Tell me what you think about this over at From Sobriety to Recovery or at Jesse Mogul, um, either or. Uh, always on there. Loving to hear your thoughts. Bless all of you for being on this journey with me. You sincerely are appreciated and you are amazing individuals. As always, please be kind to one another. Be inclusive, not exclusive, because we all know what it feels like to be on the outside looking in, and it sucks. It sucks. So build up that new neural pathway. <laughs> Don't listen to the stuff you hear in the 24-hour news cycle. Be inclusive. Love. Be humble. Be grateful. And most importantly, have integrity for yourself and for everyone else around you. The world will be a better place. The power of positive energy, everyone. Mwah! release and flow. See you soon.